Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you for the privilege of not only receiving this award, but to also give this keynote address. Uh, perhaps before I get to the topic at hand, which is to discuss the issue of expert therapist, I could make a personal observation about uh, what led to the contributions of uh, being nominated among one of the ten top psychotherapists of the century in that survey in the American Psychologist. And it, it has often puzzled me about this. I grew up in New York City, if that is not already apparent <laughs> from my accent. In fact, having been in Canada for some 30 odd years, a colleague, when I lecture for him, introduces me as the only individual member of the university committee who speaks neither the two official Canadian languages. Um, it turns out that in New York City, people talk to themselves all the time. This is even well before 9-11 so that you get off the train station in New York City and your goal is to get from the train station to your house without getting mugged. This is a very important objective. So you become rather street smart. And one of the things that happens is when you come off the train and you see a congregation of individuals who you might consider as high risk, okay? You start to talk to yourself. You say, okay, go slowly, okay? Just wait here, okay? I mean, you see those guys? Half of them are ADHD anyway. How long could they stay together, right? <laughs> right? Oh, look at that, I'll stop in here, okay? Oh, oh, he's big and strong, I'll walk, oh, a cop, oh, I made it, okay? So you talk to yourself all the time in New York. So what happens is I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign for graduate school. And I worked with schizophrenics on thought disorder. So what did I do? I taught schizophrenics to talk to themselves. <laughs> See, they're doing it anyway. So I thought that this would be a novel way to formulate therapy. I mean, if they're saying pathogenic verbalizations, could I influence so they give coherent, task-relevant interactions, both to themselves and others? And then I went from there to the University of Waterloo, which is an hour west of Toronto, for those who are new to Canada or visiting. And what I did there was to teach a whole variety of populations to talk to themselves. You know, hyperactive kids, kids who have antisocial behavior, people who are anxious, people who are depressed. And moreover, as you'll see later today, I even try to not only get people to talk to themselves, I try to get them to reformulate the nature of the story they tell themselves and others as a result of having been victimized. So what I did was I took that New York style of coping and called it cognitive behavior modification. <laughs> you know? And I don't understand how I became one of the top ten influential psychotherapists. Okay, I thought everyone does this. What's the big deal? I'm, I, I'm not going to give the award back. But I thought you should just take it with a little bit of a moderate, you know. And in fact, my mother, just with one other moment of indulgence here, who died recently, I used to eat dinner with her every night. Now, my mother was very interesting, and because one of the things that she would do is she would ask you, how was your day? But rather than pause and wait for your answer, she would tell you how her day went. See, this was an interactive ploy to solicit your interest. 
Now, my mother was very interesting because not only would she tell me what her day was like, she would tell me about various stressful events and my sisters and so forth, and she would also tell us what were the kinds of thoughts and feelings she had in that specific situation. And then she would do a public modeling of which were good thoughts and which were bad thoughts. You know, I said to myself, Flo, what? And then I say, why should I get myself down? So I realize, and I've, I've given interviews like this, that the origin of cognitive behavior therapy is my mother. <laughs> you know, I can do a very scholarly analysis of, you know, the origin from Immanuel Kant to Wilhelm Wann, the personal analysis. I mean, I've written about that. But it's really my mother who deserves this award. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm willing to share that with her. In fact, I once thought that Woody Allen, who grew up not too far from where I lived, must have had dinner with my mother. <laughs> and then when he married, his niece, I don't know what the relate, I realized he never ate dinner with my mother. <laughs> He could never have married. I mean, this is not something that you could do and eat dinner with my mother. This. Okay. The task before us in attending this conference or thinking about the field is what makes someone an expert therapist. Now, the area of expertise is a fascinating area that we have been involved in. In fact, with a colleague named Andy B. Miller, we wrote a book called Nurturing Independent Learners. I wear two hats, one sort of a clinical hat and the other sort of a developmental hat. And in this book on nurturing independent learners, one of the things we did was to ask, look at the question, why do smart kids keep getting smarter and other kids fall further and further behind? So that if you go into any local high school in your area, that teacher is confronted by students in his or her class who differ by six grade levels. Now, just imagine the challenge. Now, one of the things that becomes interesting is how did they get that far apart? Because if you look at students coming into schools, they differ by approximately three grade levels in terms of readiness and a whole bunch of social skills and the like. So the question is, how did they get to be so far apart? And moreover, you could think about the kids who are achieving as being experts in how to access and use the system in terms of nurturing the environment and the like. And moreover, one of the jobs that we engaged in was what could expert teachers do to close that gap? And in that domain, in the preparation of this work, we reviewed the literature on experts. Psychologists have studied all kinds of experts. Chess players, bridge players, goal players, diagnosticians, athletes, painters, musicians, Morse code operators. They've even studied expert waiters. I mean, you've encountered this. Someone who comes over to a table eight and never writes anything down, right? And then with grace and style, they're able to give you the order back, as compared to the waiter who writes everything bound and then comes back to the table and says, I got a chicken, someone at the table ordered a chicken? Who, who raise your hand if you got the chicken, okay? <laughs> so the question is, what makes someone an expert? I mean, you come to a town like this, you want to know, Who's the expert chef? Where should I eat? Where are the expert artists? You spend a great deal of time and effort in search of experts. You want the expert tax account. You want the expert car mechanic. 
You want the expert surgeon. And the key question is, you want the expert therapist. So to begin with, to set the stage for this, I would like you to think about who is the most expert therapist in your community, uh, besides yourself. No, I mean, a moment of humility here, okay? I mean, if you were in distress, or a family member or friend were in distress, whose name would you give in order for them to achieve help? Not only that, if you had an opportunity to watch this person do what they do, okay, so you could be a fly on the wall watching this, if you could get videotape interactions, what is it that they would do that so impresses you? So what I would like to do to begin with, before I give you my answer to the question, is to take a moment, given your own backgrounds, which are highly varied, to get a sense of what it is that you think characterize expert therapist. And then what I'm going to do is juxtapose it with an analysis of the literature, and also our own work in this domain, and then you could take issue with, or we could dialogue about what it is that would characterize this expert therapist. So without further ado, let me just take a moment and, and see if I can get some sense of uh, suggestions that you think make for an expert therapist. Well, let me just, yes sir, please. Nice. He's nice, or she's nice. Nice. If we were going to operationalize nice, what would we see? I mean, nice. Just uh, give me just a sense of what. Smile. Kind. Considerate, right? Empathic, okay? So what I'm doing is saying, you're saying one of the things that characterize this niceness is both nonverbal and verbal kinds of interactions, right? So if we were actually going to see it, you go, ooh, that is nice. Okay? Or that is empathic. Okay? Okay? Let's, get, get, let's just get a whole bunch of things. What, what does an expert therapist do? What is it you, yes, ma'am. Huh? Listen. Listens. Okay. Okay, and let's just get a whole bunch of things. I mean, you, 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 yes, go, wait, hang on, go ahead, sir. Observe. Observant. Okay, not only of the person, but also of themselves, right? And they may be observant about what's said and what's not said, and the timing. See, they have a good deal of knowledge, and they're bringing that knowledge to bear. Yes, sir. Curious. They're curious. Okay, and not only are they curious, they may model that curiosity for their clients. Yes, sir. They're caring. They're interested, or act as if, right? No, no. Yes, please. They're respectful. What else would you see these people do? Okay. I'm sorry? Understanding. Okay. Yeah, but what other task do you want, right? They, they, they would challenge. Okay. They would reframe the person's... Right. So not only would they, they, they would challenge it, but they would reframe it. Okay? And then they got to check to see whether the reframing works. Right? Remember what insight is. Insight is the degree to which the patient agrees with the therapist's interpretation. <laughs> I mean, so you got to watch what reframing means, right? Okay? Remember patients over the course of time have dreams in the same language system as the therapist. You know, so you go to Jungian, you have Jungian dreams. You have Freudian, you go to Freudian dreams. You go to cognitive behavior therapist, you have New York dreams. 
Yes, sir. They collaborate. They collaborate. This is really interesting. Okay. What other kinds of core tasks? Yes, please, ma'am. Is that like being nice? <laughs> no, no, no. Could say, say that again. I mean, because that's. No, 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 no. Give me, give me, say that again. I don't. Could you say that? In, I mean, could I just get it? No, I, I, I see. I, I think that's a real important kind of thing. Because one of the things that you're, you're saying that's important is that they're very sensitive to individual and contextual factors. And the way in which they operate is very sensitive, whether it's culturally specific or gender specific or what have you, or age related. So attending to the individuality of where people are. So the way I do cognitive behavior therapy with the developmentally delayed or as an IQ of 70 versus a highly articulate individual will be very different. So I think that being sensitive to that is what I would see as being contextually concerned. Okay? Yes, sir. So what they know how to, what they do is they use humor in a strategic fashion. Right, they show empathy. Okay? Now I'm going to give you some tr tr unbelievable stories out of 9-11 or other tragedies where in fact your humanity comes out and bees is a key factor. Just one or two more and then I'm going to try and give you my answer. Yes sir, in the back. They're present and discerning. discerning. Okay. Okay, yes. They have a perspective, some storyline that they're giving that lends itself in some kind of coherent fashion that will guide and influence the nature of the discussion. Okay. Well, I think that's a, a really good beginning. Um, and what I'm going to do is try and give you my answer to what makes someone an expert. Because if you look at the literature on expertise, it's really quite fascinating. And one of the things that we know that makes someone an expert is that they differ in three general domains. The first kind of thing that experts differ in is that they have a lot more knowledge about things. They know a lot. I mean, that's part of what makes someone an expert. They have a lot of facts. Okay? And if you're really interested in the research on this, just go to chapter two of the Mike Baum and B. Miller book where we reviewed all the literature on expertise. So they know a lot about things. Okay? And moreover, they have what is called strategic knowledge. So they have a lot of if-then rules that guide and influence. And moreover, one of the things that we know from the work on chess players, bridge players, and life is that knowledge is organized really well so that they're able to access that and move in a kind of important way of retrieving and using information. So for those people who attended the workshop this morning, I talked about conditional knowledge as well. You know, so if you get marital, if you get depression in married couples, that immediately tells the expert that you should go for and assess for marital distress. Marital distress and depression go hand in hand. When you get marital distress, you should go for domestic violence. When someone says to you that I've been depressed all my life, that's an immediately edifying concept that immediately in your head as an expert, a whole bunch of things should go off in terms of possible exposure to invalidating environment, exposure to victimization, exposure to physiological processes of where this is a byproduct. And you're going to see this in the videotape I'm going to show you in a few moments in terms of some of these kinds of dialogue that I think experts need to engage in. Not only that, experts have a lot of strategies. And they're able to call these strategies into play and to monitor their effectiveness. So if you're going to use humor, the timing and way in which you do it. 
If you're going to nurture a therapeutic alliance, which I'm going to highlight is the key ingredient here, then you can start to see how can you individually tailor that. When do you involve the significant other? When do you go outside? What is the way in which you do a case conceptualization? And the other thing that makes someone an expert is practice. You don't just become an expert, you need to have practice. And it's not just any kind of practice, it's deliberate practice. Okay? You've got to have a goal and work towards that, achieving that goal. And in fact, the literature suggests that you don't become an expert at something until you've been at it for seven years. So even if you look at Mozart's music, musicologists indicate that only after he's been at it, I mean, this child prodigy, only until he's been at it seven years do you get complex integration of scores and the like. That's kind of interesting. And the key question is, what, is it, what does it take? I mean, what are you learning? What's the deliberate practice? So now we can start to look at what does the literature say about an expert therapist, right? I mean, our goal is always to improve our own level of expertise. And one of the things that I've tried to do is to enumerate this. So hopefully, everybody has a handout. Anyone missing a handout? Okay. Paul's missing a handout. Okay, if you just hold your hand up, there are some people who have handouts. While you're, those are being distributed, let me tell you the most important information that's in this handout. The most important information in the handout is on the cover page. And what's on the cover page are various ways that you could choose to get in touch with me subsequent to this presentation if you want to dialogue about these core tasks. Okay? Yeah, there is. The email address should be I only extend the invitation because I gave the wrong address. No. No. <laughs> the, the email address should be what arts, A-R-T-S, so the E there should be an A. Okay? The rest is correct. So it's dmike at what arts, uwaterloo.ca. And I'll give you other addresses as we go along. Okay? Okay. So what makes someone an expert therapist? Let's say you want to have a rich and rewarding life as a therapist. You wanted to have a good reputation. You wanted to have success. I mean, clearly one of the things that characterizes an expert therapist is that they should get good results. Right? I mean, it's interesting. You know, when I ask people this, what makes someone an expert? People should get better. I mean, you don't want to go to a surgeon who people get worse with. You want to give me the track record that this really makes a difference. Okay? I got breast cancer. I got four different possibilities here. I could do nothing. I can get a tepectomy. I can get a I can Tell me the data on each one. I do not go to a doctor. Okay? Without walking in a printout of whatever procedure they're going to use. You go to www.clinicalevidence.org and find out exactly what they should do. Okay? I mean, they don't keep up with the data. You want to know. So, psychotherapists should get good results. So, what is the most important skill you could have in your repertoire if you want favorable results? It turns out that the most important skill you should have is the ability to choose your patients carefully. If you could choose who you see, you will get good results, okay? People go, oh, he's good. That is impressive, okay? <laughs> you want to know, you want what are called yavises. Young, attractive, verbal, intelligent, and successful people like yourself, okay? <laughs> you want Axis I disorders, non-psychotic, with no comorbid experience, with no prior victimization, with good coping skills, with lots of supports. If you could delimit your practice to these people, you will be considered an expert, because these people are going to get better with or without you. So you might as well take credit for the change, okay? Okay? This is what drug companies want on their initial trials for medication. Okay? They screen out everyone else, you know that? 
you know, on medication, this is great stuff. You know, when you read about clinical trials, they've excluded everyone else who's problematic, all comorbid disorders and the like. And then what happens is once they get success and it gets applied in the field, everyone applies it to populations that was never validated on in the beginning. So one of the things that becomes interesting is patient variance accounts for the largest proportion of the pie. Now, many of us do not have the option, nor the pension or desire to delimit our practice to just Yavis's. Not only that, epidemiological studies indicate that 50% of the psychiatric community has a history of victimization. So therefore, it's unlikely you're going to get these pure cases. So then the question becomes, if in fact you can't select patients, what else could you do to improve your level of expertise? The answer to that question is on the next page of the handout. What I've done is to enumerate 12 core tasks. The first seven of which I'm going to suggest apply to every single type of therapy you do. I don't care if you call yourself cognitive behavioral, psychodynamic, family systemic, solution focused. This is what expert therapists do. The last five tasks are additional tasks that you have to include from my perspective if in fact you are working with people who have a history of victimization. I mean, what makes it difficult to work with people who have PTSD or complex PTSD? And the key question is, what does it do in terms of these additional core tasks that you need to consider? Thus, you'll see I came up with 12 core tasks. I spend enough time with people in 12-step programs that I thought I should have my own 12 steps. Now, this is a very interesting issue. How do you get these 12 core tasks? Part of it derives from an amalgamation of the literature that I'm going to refer to, as well as 30 years of clinical experience. If you look at those features that you highlighted, they fit mainly under the heading of therapeutic alliance. And it turns out that the positive nature of that therapeutic alliance is the most important predictor over patient variance in predicting outcome. I don't know if you've been following the debate between Division 29 versus Division 12 of the American Psychological Association, because you have a debate going on between empirically-based relationship interventions versus empirically based specific techniques. If you look at the outcome of these interventions, the largest proportion of variance is accounting for by the quality and nature of the relationship. Specific interventions account for anywhere from 1 to 15 percent of the intervention. So last year at this time, I gave this presentation to the people who were at the International Congress on Behavior and Cognitive Therapy. And I got up there and I said, I want each and every one of you to note that you have dedicated your life to somewhere between 1 and 15 percent of the variance. I don't know how much heart we should take from that. Now, I think techniques are important. But I think it becomes very interesting to think about this issue, about what are the key ingredients. Interestingly, we know a fair amount about the nature of the therapeutic alliance. Now, therapeutic alliance is interesting, because you could start to think about how many of the things that you enumerated get subsumed and documented, in terms of empathy, in terms of listening, in terms of non-judgmental, in terms of collaborative goal-setting, in terms of Borden's work and the like, uh, and you could start to see that this is not unique to just psychotherapy. 
with a colleague, Dennis Turk, we wrote a book on facilitating treatment adherence. And I love to talk to doctors. Because one of the things that emerges is that in most instances, patients don't do anything we ask them to do. I mean, what unifies everyone in this room? I mean, what do we have in common? What's in common is that in most instances, people don't do anything we ask them to do. They don't take the meds. They don't do the homework. They don't follow through on the behavioral assignments. They don't read the material we give them. I mean, that's what unifies us as a group. <laughs> so one of the things that becomes interesting is it turns out that doctors who are liked get better results than doctors who are not liked. They are nice. <laughs> yeah. They care. They listen or act as if they listen. Okay? So one of the things that becomes interesting is doctors who are incompetent but well-liked get sued less. That has an impression on doctors I lecture. Okay. So one of the things that becomes very interesting is the degree to which this therapeutic alliance is in some ways correlated with outcome. Now, this gets a little bit more complicated because there are various scales to get at helping alliance. Horvath, Barrett Leonard, and so forth, that people have tried to measure this category and then relate it to outcome. But that's merely correlational. Now note that there are three ways to, to evaluate the quality of the relationship. I could ask the patient. I could ask the therapist. I can videotape you interacting with the patient and give it to independent judges to see the degree to which you meet our standard. It turns out that if you ask patients, that is the best predictor of the outcome. If you ask independent judges to evaluate it, that's a good predictor. If you ask therapists, how good is the helping alliance going, the relationship? It predicts Zippo in terms of outcome. It only predicts self-satisfaction. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm good. I mean, I should be giving the workshop, okay? I just, you see that session? This is good stuff. I mean, I am it. I am, who, who wants to refer people to me? This, I am it, okay? Zippo! Okay. One of the things that becomes interesting is that the relationship between outcome and therapeutic alliance is complex in nature, actually. So if you look at Derubis' work on cognitive therapy of depressed people, one of the things that you find out is that if you do the assessment of therapeutic alliance over the course of time, so it's not only at the beginning and then outcome, but you do it each session along the way, it turns out that sometimes you get improved in outcome and then you get improvement in the perception of the relationship. So think of this as ongoing movies rather than as two slides at different points in time. So therefore you might get significant improvement in terms of alleviation of symptomatology whereby the patient then evaluates as being more helpful that leads to further improvement so you can start to think of this as a dynamic interplay rather than just a correlative event. This has lots of implications if you want to study this ingredient. And as I'm going to highlight for you, not only have I tried to enumerate these 12 core tasks, but we've tried to demonstrate how they could be each implemented and evaluated, both with people who have problems with trauma, as well as more recently in my work on anger and aggressive behavior. And I'll have more to say about where that material is available a bit later on. What's the second core task? that I think is common to all therapists. I think the second core task that all therapists engage in is some form of education. Now, education is not a didactic lecture in this fashion, but that therapists have multiple means of how they educate patients. Sometimes they give bibliotherapy, often at too high a level or too demanding, that patients don't read. 
Sometimes they use self-monitoring in a kind of collaborative fashion. Sometimes they use collaborative case conceptualization. Sometimes they use storytelling. Therapists are really big storytellers. And they use teaching stories that are short. And they confirm the degree to which the person gets that story. So one of the things that happens is that we are in the midst of educating, and it's not like you do education and then afterwards you do therapy. Education occurs all along the way in terms of how you monitor, the way in which you give feedback, and moreover, sometimes in the area of trauma, for instance, you will get exposure down the road in terms of education, in terms of relapse prevention, or in terms of anniversary effects and the like. So in your enumeration, not only do you have to be nice and empathic and listen, observant, and so forth, they need to be able to educate people about the nature of their condition so that it makes sense. Because I'm going to give you a constructive narrative perspective on this. Because we are in the business of collaborating in meaning making with individuals, as you're going to see on the videotape. Multiple ways of doing education. And they check comprehension along the way. Third, I don't think you get improvement in patients without nurturing hope. I think it's real interesting to think about the role that hope plays in the therapeutic process. And whether you go back to Viktor Frankl, who's the father in many ways of this conference, to people like Jerome Frank, Hans Strupp, or more recently in the work of C.R. Snyder, his notion is that you nurture hope by having people engage in goal planning and goal setting and collaborative goal consensus. So what hope is involved in is translated so that when I meet a patient, I say to them, look, let me tell you what I do for a living. What I try to do is I try to figure out with the people I see how are things going in their lives right now. I then try to figure out with them how would they like things to be down the road, both soon after we finish and even further on down the road. And the third thing that we do is what could we, remember therapeutic alliance is important, we do to help you get there. Not only that, I would like us, our current efforts, to be informed by what you've tried in the past. I'd like us to learn from where you've been. And finally, I'd like us to consider what might get in the way, along the way, in terms of barriers. Now, I don't say that all at one time. What I'm going to do is chunk that. So what do I do for a living? It's not complicated. I try to find out how things are in your life. I try to figure out how you would like them to be. I try to figure out what could we do to help you get there. I'd like our current efforts to be informed by what you've tried in the past. Not only that, as we start this, what barriers, obstacles might we encounter that we could plan for? And in fact, you will see that I spend a great deal of time talking about how to nurture hope. And at this point, let me just interject that I consult at a lot of different places for a whole variety of diverse populations. And, and I also run an institute in Miami called the Melissa Institute, which is designed to reduce violence and treat victims of violence. Melissa was a young lady who grew up in Miami, and she was murdered in St. Louis. And her family started an institute in her name. Um, and the institute's designed to do three things. One is it provides student scholarships. So if there are any graduate students here who are doing work in the area of violence prevention or treatment of victims of violence, one of the joys of my life is to give away other people's money to things I think are worthwhile. And if you're in Canada, we give away US dollars. 
This is very important to know, okay? Okay, because the last guy won it from UBC, okay? And, and I called him up. I said, you won $2,000. And he go, oh, that's like 3,500 Canadian. Like, oh, it's that bad. Oh, really? Anyway, so the second thing we do is we do a lot of consultation uh, for our juvenile assessment centers, the mayor's office, and the goal of the Melissa Institute is to bridge the gap between scientific findings and public policy, clinical application, and the like. In that domain, in terms of education and training, we've put together two handbooks so that when I say, you know, this is how you do goal setting and the like, I just, I'll bring these to your attention. There's a handbook on treatment of post-traumatic stress disorders, and there's a recent one on anger. And if you're interested, they're available down there, and there is a discount rate for the conference of $50 savings. Okay? So if you're interested, just check that out. But when I say goal, training is important, you could just go into the handbook and say, I want goal setting, and it'll give you 12 pages on how to do it. I want relapse prevention, it'll tell you how to do it. Okay? What am I doing and why? I'm trying to have you think about what constitutes an expert therapist. And as I asked you at the outset, what constitutes expertise, almost all of the answers you gave were in this first domain. And that's not bad because that accounts for most of the variance. But I'm going to suggest experts do a lot more than that. A lot more than being nice and listening and curious and so forth that there are specific tasks that they have to engage in. They have to educate patients in a collaborative fashion and check comprehension. They have to nurture hope. And there are a number of ways of nurturing hope, as you're going to see in the tape that I'm going to show you in a moment, in terms of getting timelines and trying to find out what people have been able to accomplish in spite of. How do you build in and nurture resilience? How do you get them to attend to the rest of the story? Next, one of the things that you need to do is to ensure that patients have coping skills. These are intra and interpersonal coping skills. So they may deal coping skills, and we know a lot about which coping skills work and which don't. So if you look at longitudinal studies of people who have chronic major depression, of people who have PTSD, one of the things that we know is that avoiding coping strategies are likely to backfire. That if you have more of a problem-solving set, you tend to do much better. Okay. We know a lot about the degree to which after symptoms are removed, you need a lot of other kinds of problems, like mindfulness and other kinds of skills in order to cope. You need interpersonal skills. Cognitive Behavior Mod has been particularly helpful, and in our own work on stress inoculation training, both on a preventative and therapeutic basis, we've been able to highlight what it is you need to teach in terms of skills. You're an expert therapist. You have to consider that teaching skills is inadequate. You can't just train and hope for generalization or transfer. The data is overwhelming in its conclusion that nothing generalizes. It's the most consistent finding in the entire literature. So you could run residential programs and spend tons of money. In California, they spend anywhere from $80,000 to $105,000 a kid in a residential program. What do you think the likelihood is of that kid using any of those skills when they leave? There's an industry in North America called NatCap where they take kids out of high-risk environments and put them into these kinds of camps, you know, activities, these, all of that data indicates that they don't use it when they go back. Nothing generalizes unless you build generalization in. So if you're an expert therapist, there is a checklist of what you need to do to get generalization. What's that checklist? You go to the Anger Book, look under generalization, it gives you 23 things you got to do. What you got to do before, what you got to do during, what you got to do after in order to nurture generalization. So just teaching the skills is not enough. You've got to get people to take the credit. Not only that, you've got to get people to learn the skills and apply it. And moreover, in order to nail down these skills, you've got to get them to be able to teach it to someone else. If you can't 
to learn a skill and teach it to someone else or verbally represent the task in a procedural flow chart or what have you, you are unlikely to employ it in other settings. So you've got to put people in the consultative mode. This has major implications for group therapy, for instance. And you can start to see, you know, if you look at the literature, in fact, when I put together this list of what you need to get generalization, since I'm on the editorial boards of lots of journals, we get training studies submitted. So my notion is, in the future, not only would you do a training study, I don't care whether it's in terms of motor skills or reading skills or social skills or coping skills with stress, you would then have to submit a report card of how many of these 23 things did you do in your study. And then you have to evaluate yourself. So you go, I did a training study, I think I got a B plus. I did 18 of the 23. You know, I, I did a training study, I only did six of the 23. So I gave myself a C minus. So what we learn is not that you just did a training study, we can start to get you to report on what is the technology that you need to get generalization but it's not enough to get people to perform these skills. As noted on the next page, number five, you need people to not only perform these skills and personal experiments, but you've got to make sure that they take the data as ways to unfreeze their beliefs about themselves and the world. So your suggestion that you need to restructure, what does that mean? It means that you need to have people attend to data. So you did what? No kidding. Really? And what does that mean about you, about the world? How did you handle that? And as I noted this morning in the workshop, one of the things that I try to do in therapy is to emulate that fine inquisitor of the TV personage of Peter Falk playing the character of Columbo. Okay? You know, there's this detective with the raincoat and so forth, and he uses his befuddlement and his amusement. He plays dumb. He's curious, okay? The attribute that was highlighted. In fact, as I noted this morning, I tried to train clinicians how to play dumb. For some, this is not a difficult nor challenging role. <laughs> it comes remarkably easy. Now what you got to do is how to play dumb without giving up your placebo value. Right? Because if you know nothing, why should I come to you? I mean, so you did what? No kidding. And really, and how'd you handle it this time compared to how you handled it in the past? I mean, what's that mean about you and the world? I mean, are you telling me that in spite of you've been able to? How, how'd you pull that off? And you're going to see almost all of the questions that we ask are how and what questions. Why questions are not very productive. Not only that, it's not only enough for people to take cha to change, if you're an expert therapist and I'm watching you, you got to make sure that people take credit for the change. Okay? So then the key aspect is number six. You got to see a personal agency. And if you're my expert therapist, not only are you developing therapeutic alliance and doing education and nurturing hope and teaching skills and building in generalization and getting people to take the data to unfreeze their beliefs, but you got to make sure people take credit for the changes. So you did what? No kidding. Really? How did you handle it this time compared to how you handled it in the past? Where else did you do this? Wait a second, are you telling me, are you saying to yourself that you could actually notice that you caught yourself, that you interrupted the cycle, that you had choices? I mean, is that what you're saying? Well, what the hell does this mean about you as a person? Okay? I mean, there is a subroutine that you earn your living on. And note that embedded in this feedback is my use of what are called metacognitive verbs. Notice, catch, interrupt. And in fact, I'm going to encourage you, as you'll see in the tape, to count the number of times clients spontaneously in your interactions with them use these verbs as part of their ongoing narrative. It's a very interesting, unobtrusive measure. Because remember, the name of the therapy is how do they take your voice with them? In fact, one of the most interesting questions is to ask patients the following. Let me ask you something a bit different, a bit unusual, I say to them. Do you ever find yourself out there in your day-to-day -day experience 
asking yourself the questions that we ask each other right here. Now, that's a very interesting question. Do you ever find yourself out there in your day-to-day -day experience asking yourself the questions that we ask each other right here? Because the name of the game is to have the patient take your voice with them. Remember, this is New York therapy. Okay? You want them to repeat. So you can count the number. You know, I can see how I drive myself crazy. I don't know if you ever do that. I can see I worked myself up. I can see that it was a high risk situation. So have they now taken in as part of their repertoire these kinds of verbs? And I encourage you to count the number of times patients in an unprompted fashion start to use these verbs. And I'm going to show you patients at different points in therapy and you go, oh, there it is. New York therapy, there it is. Took the voice with them. Okay. They're talking to themselves. I can, know, I can see that. Interestingly, this does not only apply to psychotherapy. There are studies in the use of medication, psychotropic medication, that shows that if the physician takes just a few minutes to talk with the patient, or the counselor takes a few minutes and asks the patient what the medication has allowed them to achieve, so that the person does not attribute the improvement just to the Prozac or the Zoloft or what have you, but rather what the medication has allowed them to do in terms of self-attribution, you do much better. And you can't just leave that to chance. If you're an expert therapist, you need to nail down attributions. You did what? Now, medication is delightful. I mean, I love the research on medication, especially since psychologists in the United States are aping, desiring to get pharmaceutical rights. I mean, this is great. They're busting their balls to get these rights, 50% of whom are never going to take the medicine they give. Okay? Now, this becomes interesting. In our book on facilitating treatment adherence, Buckaloo and Salas manipulated the characteristics of medication. And you'll like this. This is a meaning conference, right? What they did was they took psychotropic medication and gave some patients large pills and other people small pills. They gave some people capsules and they gave some people pills. They gave some people white capsules and they gave other people colored capsules. This is all the exact same medication. Turns out, big pills are more effective than small pills. <laughs> Turns out capsules are more effective than pills. It turns out that colored capsules are more effective than white capsules. So if 9-11, the threat of anthrax, okay, Chrétien never retiring, is getting to you, okay, <laughs> then one of the possibility is that you should go home and find a large red and yellow capsule, okay? <laughs> I don't care what's in it, but go for large red and yellow. Not only that, if you're going for psychotropic, you want a medication that has a Z or an X in it, okay? All the ones that work are Prozac, okay? Nexium, Zoloft, go for Zeprexa. It has Zs and Xs, okay? They're large red and yellow, okay? I mean, this is good stuff. I mean, you go through every one of these. You think it's an accident that they put every psychotropic with an X and a Z? I mean, don't you think they do research and say, I have two medicines. Which one do you think would be? I'll go for the Z and X, which is large, red, and yellow. <laughs> Everything has meaning, okay? So next time you go to a case conference and the physician says, I think that medication is indicated. You can go, I totally concur with your perspicacity in prescribing medication. I would just like us to be as effective as possible. Well, you want to prescribe the big pills or the small pills? No, that what color did you have in mind? <laughs> Does it have a Z or next in it? <laughs> no. I'm... It is not enough that people change, they have to take credit for the change. You're the expert therapist, you need to nail it down. Look how much more is involved in just therapeutic alliance. Finally, in terms of the core task, you need to do relapse prevention. 
there is a high likelihood, especially with people who have chronic mental conditions, that they're going to have relapses. In terms of 9-11 or Oklahoma City or Columbine, all of which I've been involved, there are anniversary effects. You need to help people, apropos of the work of Marlott and Wilson and others, to identify what a potentially high-risk situation, what are the warning signs, what are the lapses, what are the coping techniques. And not only that, as you'll see both in the anger book and the PTSD book, to do relapse prevention, I've enumerated 12, 20 core tasks. So when you're videotaping, oh, that guy's expert. Look at that. He did 18 of the 23 to get generalization. He just did 12 of the 20 to get relapse prevention. Oh, look at that. He's doing collaboration. So you can now do a microanalytic analysis of what makes someone an expert. You could actually go in and count the behaviors and give people feedback. Now, the life gets more complicated because I highlighted at the outset that 50% of the psychiatric community likely has a history of victimization. Now, what makes it so difficult to work with people who have PTSD and complex PTSD? Because it creates five additional core tasks, from my point of view. And those are enumerated as 7 to 12. Okay? And I'm just going to highlight these quickly, because I've spelt them out both, in, both the, in the PTSD book in some detail. The first is that there's a particular sequelae that occurs as a byproduct of victimization. So if it's a criterion A event, life-threatening and the like, one of the things that becomes particularly interesting is the degree to which you could highlight for that individual the degree how you could attend to intrusive ideation, avoidance behavior, hyperarousal, sleep disturbance, and in most instances you also have to address the issue of comorbidity. There are very few psychiatric disorders that occur singularly, only about 20% of psychiatric disorders. And for victimized clients, you have substance abuse, anger, depression, anxiety, and in terms of complex PTSD, like borderline personality disorders or antisocial behavior, you have a number of other domains. For those of you who are at the, this morning workshop or look at the handbook, this will be the occasion for you to talk to yourself because you're going to be inundated with a whole cornucopia of psychopathology. I mean, do I go for the shoplifting? No, I'll go for the, the bad checks. No, I won't go for that. I'll go for the self-injurious behavior. Oh, look at that. I'll go for the bulimia. No, I can't go for the bulimia. I'm going for the substance abuse. Oh, look at that. She's suicidal. Okay? So one of the things that happens is that you, the therapist, should be talking to yourself all the time. See, I love doing psychotherapy. I absolutely love doing it. Why? Because I love my head. I love the way I think about cases. Okay? And the way in which I could articulate that. So I can say, oh, look at that, I got here. No, don't go here, I'll go here. Okay? And you'll see that the expert therapist could do this in a seamless fashion. Next, number nine. This is a particularly challenging issue and highly controversial. And its inclusion here is because, and what I'm talking about here is what is called memory work. And from my point of view, the inclusion of this derives from the fact that you can look at longitudinal studies by Silver, Penny Baker, and others that indicate when in fact people have been victimized, when they share the account of what they've experienced with others, significant others who are supportive and understanding they do much better than if they keep it as a secret. And note that the person they share it with need not be just a therapist. It may be significant other. And note that the nature of the sharing need not only be in terms of language. For those of you who are in town, I recommend going to the Ontario, I mean to the uh, art gallery down in Vancouver and seeing the art display by Emily Carr George O'Keefe, and Frida Kahlo, and watch the movie by Kahlo. Okay? It's absolutely unbelievable in terms of PTSD and how she used her art to deal with repetitive trauma. Okay? And you can start to think about the degree to which art-expressive techniques and or rituals, okay? 
like the Vietnam Memorial, the, the creating of the Melissa Institute and finding meaning is so important to the therapy process. As I noted this morning, and, and, and let me just also observe in terms of number nine, that it's not only sharing the story, but from my point of view, it's not abreacting self-disclosure or just having exposure in the forward sense, but it's beyond that. It's having people consider what are the implications, what are the conclusions they could draw about themselves and others as a result of having experienced that. So do they have a feel that they can never be safe, that there's no hope, that there's no trust? I mean, is that the nature of the narrative? Are they engaged in what is called contrafactual thinking, only if, what if, why me, why now? Insofar as they pine for those things that have been lost and have no sense of the hope in the future, they're more likely to have persistent PTSD. And keep in mind that, at least in North America, you have something of the order of 70% of people who are going to have criterion A events. And if you come from countries that are war-torn, okay, I mean, entire nations have this on a repeated basis. Interestingly, at least in North America, epidemiological data indicates that only 20 to 40 percent will develop PTSD. That means 60 to 80 percent make it. So in the paper that I wrote that accompanies this presentation and also included in the PTSD book is what distinguishes the narrative between the people who make it versus those who don't. And as you're going to see in this tape, the degree to which someone sees themselves as a victim as compared to a survivor or thriver becomes an important element. And how can the therapist get them to move in that way becomes a critical skill that I think expert therapists need to engage in. Note that this memory work is often shared by a whole community of indigenous helpers. So it's not like people from Western mentality coming in and imposing their therapy. Okay? The example I gave this morning in the workshop was Ager's work with regard to survivors of Bosnia, the war there, and how they used the naturally indigenous group of women as healing elements. And what they found out is that these women tended to use healing elements, especially when they were knitting. So what was the core task of the expert? As I noted this morning, it was to find the wool. So the therapist needed to find wool and needle, needles in order to mobilize that social support group. And what are they doing? It's that kind of memory work. And it's interesting. This is not unique to psychotherapy. I mean, just take any kind of religious ritual. In the Jewish religion, if someone close dies, you sit shiva. Sitting shiva is a really interesting cognitive behavioral process. I mean, it serves other purposes. So you get all these people sitting around, and what happens is they wheel in other widows or widowers who have survived. And they tell stories. Let me tell you about your father. I can remember when, and they reconstruct memory, or they construct memories. And these become coping models. And you can go to wakes, you can go to many different ceremonial procedures and see that the memory work is being done. And not only is it being done, it is transforming the pain so that some meaning will come of it. The major way that people cope with trauma in North America is by means of religion and prayer. Religion and prayer are the major ways that people cope with trauma. And these are often ritualistic and common. Now this becomes interesting because you can think about in lots of group work, how do they build in rituals? How do they get people to take credit? So you have open-ended and closed groups. So when you have open groups, you have new people coming in while others graduate. Not only did the people graduate, but they say, tell us what you were like when you first came in. How have things changed? Who else has seen this? So you constantly have people, and what went on in therapy that led you to this? What else experienced? So what happens is you use the group as an activity. They have graduation ceremonies. And in the PTSD book, I, I map out innumerable ways that this is done in a culturally sensitive way. Number 11. You need to have people reconnect with individuals other than just victims so that the definition of who they are is not just the victim. 
So when I work with head injured, you gotta make sure that people don't say I'm a head injured person. I happen to be Don who happens to have a head injury. Who are you and what is it that you have? Everybody's got something. So it is not the defining characteristic. And this becomes really important, for example, if you're working in the VA hospitals. Because in the VA hospitals, for instance, you could show that you can get a lot of symptomatic relief, but people's level of functioning and adjustment do not improve. Or even in the work on cognitive therapy with depressive now, even though you get symptomatic relief, people have continuing long-term kinds of difficulties. And moreover, the vulnerabilities they bring to the setting become more important than what they actually experience. And as I noted this morning, that calls for a lot of schema change as you're going to see. Last, there is a very high likelihood that people who have been victimized will be re-victimized. So therefore, the expert therapist needs to nail down what else can people do to not get back into that same situation. So if they lapse, what could go on? So for example, the Juvenile Assessment Center in Miami takes in approximately 18,000 kids a year. That's, that's amazing. Okay? You got about 35% of them are females. Of those 35% of females, you have about 70% of them who have been repeatedly victimized and have PTSD. They are likely to go out and be re-victimized in a similar fashion. So the key question is, what skills can you teach in terms of safety? And there are interventions that are designed to not only teach them these skills, but to build in generalization. So one of the skills under the, the, in the Javits' program, Safety First, is not only to teach them coping skills, but how do you make sure that they could take it out with them? Because right? we have no money to provide follow or aftercare. So what they do is they teach these kids internet skills and how to access their therapist even when they leave. How to be part of a web. So in terms of generalization, you could start to think rather creatively on how you could build in ways to avoid re-victimization. So now you have what expert therapists do. Someone can come to say to you, what is it you do for a living? You say, I try to be as expert a therapist as possible. Really? What does that mean? If I was there, what would I see? Well, I'm glad you asked. One of the things I try to do is I spend a lot of time in developing a therapeutic alliance. Since that's such an important thing. In a non-judgmental, compassionate, sympathetic way, I allow people to tell the story. Not only that, I want them to tell the rest of the story. I want them to give me the sense of what they've been able to accomplish. Not only that, like any kind of learning experience which therapy is, I also do some kind of education in a kind of discovery fashion, because when people discover things, they do much better than my just giving it to them. And we have a lot of different ways. I try to nurture hope. I try to get the rest of the story. I teach skills, not only that, I ensure that people have the higher likelihood that they're going to apply it. And when they do those skills out there, I make sure that they take the results of their efforts as ways to unfreeze their beliefs about themselves, the world, and the future. And when they make changes, one of the things I do is I make sure they take credit for the changes so that they don't attribute it to me, the therapist, and or the medication. And given that their problems are likely to occur again and again, we do what is called relapse prevention. And moreover, when I have people in my sessions who have a history of victimization, even though I charge the same amount, it increases the demand on five additional tasks. Now, I have worked on non-adherence for a long time. In fact, if you get to our book on facilitating treatment adherence, you should read the last chapter. Because the last chapter is entitled, Why You, the Reader, Won't Do Anything That We Have Suggested in the Course of Writing This Book. Okay? So there's lots of data that healthcare providers, doctors, physicians, x-ray technicians, psychotherapists, don't do what is recommended. So I have very little confidence you're going to do these things. So what is our current efforts? Our current efforts is to develop training materials for patients. 
so that then when they come in to see you, they will be able to go online beforehand to see what an expert therapist does. So when they come in and say to you, Dr. Mike and Bam, I really appreciate the way in which you listen so attentively to everything I have to say. I was wondering, do you think there would be any time for us to talk about the rest of the story? Would you like to hear what I've been able to accomplish in spite of? <laughs> Dr. Mike, when you come from New York, you use such big words and talk so fast. Could you just slow it all down and check my understanding along the way? <laughs> <laughs> Where should I get the hope, Dr. Meichenbaum? What's going to be different now as compared to other times? Now that I've tried to make some changes, do you think I, the patient, played any small role in contributing to change? I know you go from conference to conference, workshop to workshop, collecting CEUs, but do you think I played any small role in I gather the problems I'm having is likely to occur again and again. Before we break out, do you think we should thin out the schedule of beatings? Okay, do you think we should talk about what are the high-risk situations down the road and how I might be able to deal with them? Did I mention I had a history of victimization that's documented that we should address? No. Could you imagine having patients come in and talk to you like that? <laughs> they wouldn't need you, right? But that is exactly where the field is going. Okay. And moreover, one of the things that's interesting is it already exists. So the National Institute of Health, for instance, have now put out a small checklist. So if you go to your pediatrician and your kid has an ear infection and the pediatrician writes amoxicillin, there's a little card of four things the pediatrician should tell you. Okay. So what happens is the mother goes in with the card. So by the time the third mother comes in, the pediatrician, I know the questions! Lighten up! Okay. I just did a whole computer-based program for people to take medication, which is highly interactive, and there's a printout of exactly what the patient should be told by the doctor. And it says, when you go into the doctor, make sure they cover all this material. So this is consumer-driven to shape the field. Our task is to demonstrate how these 12 core tasks are going to be employed. So what I'd like to do is to show you a patient. Now, 